Welcome back everyone. Today's video is going to cover a number of general market thoughts that I'm seeing or that I'm having, I guess I should say, and reactions and responses to different sentiment that I'm seeing out there. Not sentiment in the strictest sense, but kind of stories that I hear people uh, telling about what they're seeing in the market and some thoughts on that, along with some commentary on FOMO, the Fed, alternatives to just buying stocks. And if I'm bullish or bearish, kind of. Now, the first thing I'm seeing a lot, really, and it's all over social media, a lot of commentaries that I'm seeing about the market, about what's going to happen next. And that is, it's very specific, oddly. The market's going to crash, and then the market's going to the moon. And this is not a pre-March thing. This is a post-March thing. And I think this is really interesting, just in terms of, um, I, I understand the story that people are saying, the market will crash, print tons of money, and then the market will go to the moon. And I mean, it kind of did. I mean, we did crash. We did. Will we crash again? Absolutely. Will it be next month or in 10 years? No idea. But we did crash recently. Then what happened? The Fed printed tons of money so to speak, and then the market shot up. Now, I don't think that people think this is on the moon. Is it? Eh, debatable. But the point is, if you think that the market is just going to rocket to new highs while the Fed continues to print money, that's where I disagree. Because the, market, the Fed will, will not, the central banks will not continue to print money as the market soars to all-time highs at the same pace that they would if the market was crashing. So while the market does feel very managed at this point, I don't think it's going to be that easy as buying it at the crash. And I'm saying this tongue-in-cheek because very few, if any, people will ever catch the bottom of anything. Now, the next thing I'm seeing is that there's a lot more Let's call it retail in the market, the Robin Hood. Um, a lot of people opened accounts in March or April, up a lot of money, good for them. Um, and so there's a lot more speculation, retail speed of the market moving. And I have to be honest, I think this is amazing. I think it's great that people, average people, every person really is getting back into the market. I think. The other day, someone was telling me, um, they were lamenting really about how only business owners or people with their own business or that work for themselves can really make big money these days. And most people are stuck in a job. And my first thought was, there's not really that big of a hurdle to becoming a business owner. And of course, it's difficult to start a business, open up and do create your own thing. But what I mean is anyone, and I mean almost anyone, can really open a brokerage account. And if they have a bit of money and they or they could put aside a little bit of money, they could become a business owner. And I think that's amazing. And I really like the amount of people that are able and are starting to put some money aside, invest get themselves on a better, better financial footing, and, you know, maybe dream a little. And I think that if, I, I truly believe that if more people and if almost, I mean, if everyone managed their own finances, there would be a more full understanding in the society of not only how the system works, but why the, why the financial system does what it does and how to uh, better fit your financial well-being within the system. All that said, I do have some reservations, or one might even call it concerns, about where all of this new money in the market is going. And I really hope that the market, that the new 
people in the market can succeed without um, potentially putting money, more money in places where the expected return over time is potentially not that great and um, maybe just fueling, fueling parts of an overvalued sectors. I really hope that people can succeed and I hope that people do their own research and can succeed and don't just buy a stock because it's going up. And that's what concerns me, but I really think it's great that more people and that more people are joining the market. Now, as I kind of just touched upon, the retail presence in the market is increasing the level of FOMO to a point where it is a bit concerning. The other day, I was speaking to someone and they basically said that they were trying to open a brokerage account, a tax advantaged account. And the brokers or something messed up a first time and then a second time, and then they submitted for a third time and they told them, hurry up, I've got some trading to do. This has already cost me $100 a share on Apple. Now, I hadn't realized how fast Apple had really rocketed um, from 400 to 500. But, I mean, that was concerning in amongst itself. And then um, I made some comment about remembering when Apple traded at like 10 times earnings or 15 times earnings or whatever. And it, it moved all the way, it's all the way at 30 something times earnings now. And what concerned me even more was a few minutes later when the guy asked me, he said, when you say earnings, what do you mean? Are you talking like revenue? And this was concerning for the fact that he was going to buy Apple and he maybe didn't know what earnings meant and didn't know what multiples or what price he was paying, might have been paying relative to um, what Apple might maybe should be worth. And I think this is just indicative potentially of some of the level of FOMO in the market. And I think that a good bit of this may be fueled by the stocks only go up sentiment, which I mean, makes a lot of sense coming from buying a stock that has just fallen 70, 80 or 90%. So you can think of stock thing at such a steep discount without maybe considering how it got to where it is. But anyway, uh, I, I understand where the sentiment came from. Over the long term, stocks have been a good place to be. Um, the short term, there's definitely some concerns, but for sure, if the stocks survive, if things turn around, there's a lot of, probably a lot of stocks that can do quite well from here. Now, I did just wanna follow up on a few things that I mentioned in the prior slide. One being that stocks have been a good place to be for a long term and probably will continue to be over the future long term long term and the other being that people may not be acutely aware of exactly how much they're paying at times now what i wanted to point to with this is that the s p 500 the index fund um, that tracks the index and i think a lot of people would say and i would probably say to someone new if they're saying, okay, where should you put money if you're not gonna to touch it for 30 years? I might go with an index fund. That said, at this point, I don't think many of the index funds, many of the big US index funds are really what they seem to be in that, yes, they do have the, at what's called with the S&P's 500, they do have the 500 biggest stocks in the, in the world. However, the weighting of the top few stocks, maybe the top five, maybe the top 10 or 25 really, makes up the majority of the index. So what you're really buying is super cap tech. And so if you may not like the valuations of the super cap tech, what you're really doing is not diversifying, you're just buying more of 
well, what's what's already big. And I think that this is something worth noting and something worth considering, especially as the, the money pours into the market, pours into passive, pours into the biggest of the names. It, I, I don't know how it will play out if it goes sideways and the bottom catches up or how it'll work, but it's, the index is very top heavy, the NASDAQ too, and at some point there's going to be, there has to be or should be or will be, I don't know how it plays out, but I would think there's going to be some mean reversion at some point. Now, some of you are probably asking here or probably saying, aha, he said at the top end it's overvalued, overpriced, whatever you want to call it. And while I didn't say that, part of me is thinking it, part of me is thinking, you know what? What else am I supposed to do with money? You're supposed to keep it in debt or cash, as I'll get to debt being bonds, as I'll get to soon. The returns are pretty bad there, and you have some uh, some other risks. Now, I while I say yes, on some hand, they are the many of the equities at the top may be overvalued. Uh, I don't really see the 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 catalyst for people to wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, thirty five times earnings that's just too much. It should be 20 or 15 or whatever. Maybe on certain specific stocks, they start to disappoint, they fall. But realistically, you have these super cap companies that people will think, oh, there's a bit of growth. But realistically, they may be around for a long, long time. And they yield dividend yields as much as the long term bonds or what what have you. Earnings yield is higher than the 10 year whatever whatever metric you want to look at i don't think it's necessarily like ridiculous maybe maybe some of the big ones are overpriced and i mean there are some stocks i'm not going to name names but many of you probably could guess which one i'm talking about or thinking about right now some stocks i just cannot understand make no sense Maybe they're great value, but maybe they're just dreams. But many of the the blue chips, I mean, maybe they're expensive, but compared to what? Now, I say I don't see a catalyst to wake up tomorrow and say, hey, you know what? The stock is very overpriced. You could say, well, you know, things aren't good right now. Yeah, I, I know that. Many people know that. Uh, markets are not cheap right now. Again, in general, I know, but remember what I just said of most of the markets are the top few stocks. So weight that into whatever um, point you're trying to make. And again, listen to my prior few slides and I, I completely see many of these points. But again, remember, stock market isn't the economy. And if you're thinking that the stock market, the economy, whatever is expecting great things, I would suggest you might want to look at the chart or the stock or the pricing or whatever of maybe U.S. Steel or Alcoa. They're not expecting great things. They're hoping to survive at this point. So we can't just group all stocks as stocks are overpriced because many of the stocks are maybe look like they're expecting great things but some are just will they survive we don't know and that's just how they're being priced right now so we can't just say everything is the same everything is overpriced because there's many different things going on right now similarly if you look at the direction of the global economy right now are things getting better or getting worse i would suggest that they seem to be getting better Will we have a second wave? Will things get be terrible in a few months? I don't know. But for now, it seems like as bad as things are, we may be heading in the right direction in terms of the economy. 
The other point that a lot of people will probably make is look at all the leverage in the system. All these stocks, they borrowed tons of money because debt was cheap, borrowed money, used it to buy back their own shares. Now they have too much debt and there's a debt problem. And yes, this is true. Um, a lot of future returns and some equities seem to have been um, piled into share buybacks. You look at Apple, they used to have half a trillion dollars or something of cash. Now they have net debt. Why? Bought back shares. And honestly, they're in a stronger position than many of the other companies that have done the same thing. It's a debt problem. That said, when I look at this, I see it as a giant suicide pact between governments, between um, corporates, and on some level households also have, some places have way too much debt. Now, why do I say this is a suicide pact? Well, if you look at what happens if the price of the debt gets jacked up really quickly, if interest rates were to go from zero to 5% really quickly, everything would break. However, because everything would break, the Fed has their hands tied, central banks have their hands tied, they can't raise rates. So rates are stuck low for until the problem fixes itself. Now, how's the problem going to fix itself? Um, let's get to that. So I said that the Fed has their hands tied. So let's look at what they've been messaging with regards to what's happened recently and what in the past I've said is likely to happen when it comes to central banks and the Fed. Well, they've said that they're gonna keep rates low and I think they've mentioned 2022, now they're saying maybe five years, whatever. But one, keep rates at zero for a long time. Two, they've talked about a symmetric or an average of 2% inflation. Now I say this is relevant because inflation has been below 2%, at least on a measured term. Measured inflation has been below 2% for a long time. So they basically first gave themselves a out in terms of allowing inflation above 2% for a while. And now they basically came out and said, you know, average of 2% inflation. They said it at an official Jackson Hole meeting. No one was surprised, but it happened that way. Plus, they added that now full employment is also potentially more important than the inflation. So it's basically another smokescreen of, well, if there's higher inflation, but it's not full and full and inclusive employment, then we may keep allow the inflation to run hot a little bit. Again, this wasn't really a surprise when they said it or shouldn't have been because they've been kind of hinting at it for a while. But again, now they said it. So four, and I added this because it was just obvious in March or every any any time really the market struggles, they can't let the market run out of liquidity because if the market starts panicking and needs money, then it kind of spirals out of control. So they need to keep the debt markets running so that money keeps flowing through through the system and is able to ironically keep financing all the buybacks and all the debt that needs to be rolled all the time from governments from the so in summation everything liquidity matters because when it dries up everything starts to break when you put one, two, three, and four together, well, four is a bit counteracts the rest, really, but this strikes me as, okay, we need inflation well below interest rates so that we can hopefully melt away the debt problem. Now, I just want to continue here a little bit because when I look at the market, there are some sectors that seem very rocket fueled, if you will, and very popular. But there's other sectors that I think if this thesis proves to be right, well, it may benefit them and they may have the wrong um, marketing, if you will. 
So let's let's look at it this way. If you have real assets that are backed by too much debt, and that's that's their downside, that is that they have too much debt. Well, if you're going to melt away the real value of the debt then the debt might be less of an issue. And so while well, you have sectors like real estate, utilities, for example, that are kind of marketed as bond proxies in that they have yield, a bit more risk, and I'm not taking anything away from the risk because, yeah, if you have a lot of debt and uh, that's more risk than being debt, but if you're calling yourself a bond proxy, that means that the main upside might be that they have a yield. And in fairness, these things have yields well, well above the 10 year rate, um, even short term rates, any rates, really that you're gonna get on bonds. Plus, if the thesis proves to be right, that you're gonna melt away the debt with inflation, well, inflation takes the real estate prices up, takes the energy prices up. So inflation increases the value of the assets while at the same time diminishing the real value of the debt that was used to purchase the assets. So I'm just looking at these cases and I'm just seeing these stocks shouldn't necessarily be cheap, again, if the general thesis is right. So that's why I'm kind of maybe liking those asset classes a bit more. Now that being said, most of you are here or at this channel because you like going for the home run um, I mean, I talk a lot more about high risk, high potential investments. And I mean, the home run in this, if in this scenario is really a producing commodity company with way too much debt. Now, that being said, you can easily blow up by being too early on something like this. It is very risky, but, you know, commodities um, have the inflation leverage or hedge or whatever you want to call it and then the debt is the other side. Now I've thought for years that when the inflation, if, if inflation final, it were to take off in a spike, that this would be the trade, the trade, if, if you will. Now, I'm not saying it will. I mean, it could easily be 2% inflation, 0% interest rates forever, and that really doesn't help anyone. But if inflation were to take off, I'm saying, then, I mean, that would be the type of home run trade. Now, to switch topics a little bit, one of the issues that I'm seeing in the market right now is there's a lot of companies that are, maybe rightfully, very reluctant to want to spend money. Um, if you look at big capital spending projects, well, I mean, I'm not really seeing too many because many of the companies are concerned about their own liquidity. Again, I'm not sure if this is ironic or comedic, but it's probably somewhere between the two. Anyway, with all this concern about liquidity in the time of uncertainty, they're not spending. Now, interestingly, this type of event is what kind of leads to inflation. Now, if you are into cyclicals or anything cyclical, the less money that gets spent now, um, as uh, if things were to be recovering means a more fun cycle because um, eventually the market will balance out, which normally comes from higher prices, so higher prices for longer without investment, more inflation, and you can kind of get it. The other interesting point is I think that what may be the spending or the lack of spending needs in order to convince it that this isn't just a stimulus check uh, little blip might be some real infrastructure spending. Now, I think that that would be a good thing probably in a lot of places. I think there's a lot of places where infrastructure spending could be very advantageous. I don't want to be the person here who's uh, begging for it because it makes them money in the market. So, I mean, you know, obviously no one, no one in power is listening to me anyway, so it doesn't matter. But I'm just wondering if we do get a stimulus kind of kick in the pants for the economy, if you will, that would make businesses think, okay, this spending is real. It's a lot of it. We can react. Who knows? Um, but that's just what I'm thinking might counteract what is, seems to be going on in many cases. The other thing that I wanted to kind of mention is 
that there's more than one market. And I mean, this may seem like a, a duh thing once you get to it, um, but there's more than one market, more than one country, more than one sector. I mean, there's tons of different sectors, different cyclical things. I mean, everyone has their focus. Most people, it's their own country. But while the U.S. market may be surging to all-time highs or thereabouts with being led by tech stocks similar to the late 90s, there's a lot of other markets that have languished really for a decade now. And remember, markets are cyclical. And so I'm not saying that things turn around soon or things turn around at all. I mean, they could fall another good chunk before they ever turn around and someday get back to here. You never know. But when you look at the lack of investment in many places, um, over the last decade because of losing money, because of the strong dollar, because of a whole number of things. There may be some places in markets that have lagged that maybe eventually should or will catch up. Now, that being said, I say that all, way too much, don't I? Many of the foreign markets, non-US that is, have heavy weightings towards financials and commodities. And so with this weighting towards financials and commodities, if interest rates are stuck low, that may not be great for them, and, or financials at least, and commodities really kind of uh, thrive on uh, inflation and investment. So I wouldn't just say blanket check, write it to foreign investment, but what I would say is maybe there's some digging to be done in the markets uh, into specific companies in the markets that have not really done well recently. And so, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. Of course, I'm, you know, obviously and kind of ironically here, um, looking at uh, a lot at my domestic market, but I look at all over the place and a lot of sectors that have really not done great in past years. And so I suggest just doesn't have to be commodities, doesn't have to be foreign, any particular country, just have a look around. And that's all for today. Remember everyone, this is just, these are just my thoughts, a bit of my framework and not investment advice. And uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone for watching and thank for all, thank you for all your support. Um, it's been, there's been a bit of an influx recently in new subscribers and really appreciate that. But anytime that happens, I'm like, okay, now I'm going to do something and anger the algorithm and back to the void. But hope not. Anyway, hope you enjoyed. Until next time, have a great day.